I hate having this condition and I, and I wish I didn't have it, but it, one of the good things it's done to, to me is it has, you know, made me realize that there are things that previously I'd have been, I'd have shied away from that I should just accept and, and, and get on with things. Hello and welcome to Run The Business, the podcast that explores the place where running and leadership come together. We'll find out how running might help us with leading, managing people and generally being better in business. We'll also try and answer that question, do runners make better leaders? I'm Anthony Gay and today I'm joined by the CEO of the charity Parkinson's UK and someone with a strong track record of leading business around Europe, the Middle East and Africa. He was the CEO of Zurich across those territories. He's also completed 30 marathons in the last few years. He's the official double Guinness World Record holder for the most distance covered in both the 12-hour and 24-hour three-legged race. I'm sure we'll talk about that. And everything I've just outlined, he's done whilst dealing with Parkinson's disease himself. Gary Shaughnessy, welcome to Run the Business. Thanks, Ant. Good to be here. Gary, how are you today? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really well, apart from my legs are a bit stiff following a, a marathon yesterday. But um, a bit stiff is probably an understatement, to be honest. Now, you can't just sort of drop that in and, and say, <laughs> de dealing with a marathon yesterday. Tell us a little bit about where you were and uh, what marathon it was. I was in Valencia for the, uh, the Valencia Marathon. And I was a week before that, I was in... San Sebastian for the Zurich sponsored San Sebastian Marathon. And uh, um, I ran with, with a group uh, who, unfortunately, the children have ataxia intelligentsia um, and their families uh, pushed them in wheelchairs. And, and on both occasions, we ran with them and uh, it was absolutely inspirational. But uh, th this, this group really do remind you of uh, how lucky we are and how easy it is to to moan and groan about things when people really you know some people some people really have uh, a very tough life and a very tough situation gary so much to cover today and, I, and i'm so pleased to have you as a guest on on the podcast but start by telling me about 2014 and how you found out you had parkinson's uh well i i had uh discovered that I'd got a, a bit of a tremor in uh, one of my hands, one of my fingers in particular, uh, and I couldn't work out what it was. I went to uh, the doctor. Um, it wasn't causing me a lot of problem. It was just weird, really. And she didn't know what it was either. She thought it was a restless leg syndrome, which um, and told me to go away for a month and come back again. And um, it just got slightly worse. Um, and then um, they they suggested I go to see a neurologist. I went to see the neurologist, and um, uh, he got me to walk up up and down outside in the corridor, which sounds a, a weird thing to do. But one of the things about Parkinson's is you tend to swing your arms less. And um, he came back and said, "I'm pretty much convinced you've got Parkinson's," which is a real bolt out of the blue. I'd heard of Parkinson's, but I didn't know what on earth it, it really was all about. And for people listening to this who don't know what it's about, could you just give us a, an overview of, of what it means and, and what it involves? Well, there's about 40 different symptoms of Parkinson's and um, the reality is everyone who has Parkinson's seems to have a slightly different version of it um, or a slightly different journey. Uh, everyone um, who knows about Parkinson's knows about the tremor and about uh, three quarters of people who have Parkinson's do have a tremor, but it, it can also cause um, slowness of movement, it can cause lots of um, mental health issues, there's quite a correlation with um, dementia, you can have um, bowel problems, urinary problems, it's almost all, you know, across the whole, uh, the whole of your body, frankly, and it's, it's a degenerative condition, there is no known cure at the moment. The medication that we take masks the condition, the main medication was actually devised before Neil Armstrong made it to the moon, and after a while, it it you know it stops working effectively. So we're we're looking to try and find something that slows it down. One thing that does slow the condition down, which a lot of people don't recognise, is exercise. Actually, which is a big part of the the reasons which which I sort of became even more focused on exercise as a result of it. 
So tell me about your exercise routine before 2014, because, you know, and I know we'll talk about what, you know, what you've done since then, but you have done amazing things uh, and achieved so much on, you know, from a physical point of view. How active were you before that? I was reasonably active. I mean, I played um, football at, at a decent level, not not that good, but at a decent level till I was 45. I'd run four marathons, I think, up until 2014. And and I was you know, generally reasonably fit, actually. This podcast is about the relationship between running and, and leadership. Had you become aware of, of your health, your fitness as something which went in line with the work that you were doing because you held senior positions uh, in in Zurich. So were you aware of running as something that helped you be the best person that you could be? Um, Not to anywhere near the extent that I now see it. I mean, I, I used running as a way of relaxing and getting rid of stress particularly, and I still do that. Um, I find I can't run breathe and think at the same time and so I try not to think and just run and run and breathe and it's amazing how you can leave the house you've got something that's niggling at you or a real problem that's just you just don't know what the answer to it is you forget about it and um, you go running and by the time you got back to the house there's a solution or or at least some options so I, I use running and sport generally as a way of kind of switching off but but also giving myself some relaxation time, which seemed to help with problem solving. And, and thinking sp- specifically about your leadership style, what, what, how, would you, how would you describe yourself as, as a leader and how you've evolved in the last few years? You know, you're obviously CEO of the Parkinson's UK charity. How does your leadership style there sort of differ to, to you know, where you've been over the years? My leadership style is, um, I think, very different from where it was certainly, you know, 15, 20 years ago and, and for the better. When, when you get diagnosed with something like Parkinson's, it creates a vulnerability and it makes you realise that actually you don't know all the answers. You know, you, you're not perfect. You can't be this, you know, leader that's in front of everyone giving every answer which kind of is a good thing actually because what it did to me was it it made me uh recognize it wasn't a bad thing to to accept you didn't know things and actually the best possible i mean my job really has always been as a leader i just didn't recognize it but has always been to bring together the best teams to to bring together people who have different skills different capabilities and make them perform or help them perform their best by knocking down barriers that are in their way rather than by knowing the best answer to everything. And I think, you know, being vulnerable kind of makes you realise that. So so in a way, it's been a really good thing. Why did the exercise, the activity, the running become so important to you uh, in, in the last few years? What was the thing that made you want to go and do all this stuff? I always, when I went to a different country, uh, I'd always go running you know, just to get a sense or a feel of, of the country that I was going to. And I was on a, a an event in Lisbon not long after I was diagnosed. And I, I went, got up in the morning, went, went running, and I was just getting slower and slower and slower. And it really was a, a pretty sort of grim process. And I rang my wife up and said, uh, you know, look, I'm, I'm really struggling with this. And she said, you know, this is a long-term condition and you've just got to, focus on what you can do. And it was almost like a turning point. And she, it was absolutely the right thing to say. It was a turning point for me. And it um, made a big difference to how I saw the situation I was in. And, and it, you know, it kind of reminded me that basically I needed to take some level of control over my situation. And actually exercise is one of the few things that can slow the progress of Parkinson's it slows the progress of lots of chronic conditions and um, I'd found the thing that I could you know both focus on for myself but also I think there's a tendency that people kind of assume you've got a neurodegenerative condition that everything declines and I I just don't agree with putting a, a ceiling on yourself in that way so part of it for me is can I also 
raise awareness amongst people with Parkinson's that we can do something about about our own condition in this way and raise awareness amongst people generally about what, what condition Parkinson's is. What did, you know, your your colleagues and, you know, your family do and how did they behave when they understood that you and realised that you had Parkinson's and, and understood what it was? How, how did the people around you uh, rally to your support? My family have been absolutely outstanding and incredible, really. I mean, they to the extent that my wife, Janet, and my three kids, Michael, Daniel, and Bethan, all ran the London Marathon with me just over, over a year ago. And Bethan, I don't think, has forgiven me for uh, yet for entering, but um, <laughs> uh, entering into the race and, and having the you know temerity to do so. But they've been brilliant. They've been so supportive. And my colleagues have been superb. I mean, I worried that I... By telling people about Parkinson's, it would embarrass them or it would be difficult to deal with. Or, But you get to a point where you haven't got much alternative. And I've found that, you know, almost exclusively people have been supportive, empathetic. Uh, and what I want and what I think people with Parkinson's generally want is awareness and empathy, not sympathy. So I don't get, I don't get a break. I don't get a, you know, a free pass because I have Parkinson's. I just get treated as... Gary Shaughnessy, and that's what I want to be the case. You mentioned the positive mental attitude that, you know, it's important to have in anything in life, I think, really. Why do you have that? Why why did you decide to deal with this head on and take this positive mindset in, into dealing with the situation? Um, because what's the alternative? I mean, the alternative is you... you allow yourself to become a victim and you allow yourself to be immediately defeated by it. And, you know, I mean, people, lots of people I know have issues, conditions, you know, family troubles, whatever it happens to be. Yes, it's not a nice condition. It's relentless. But just giving up and and just taking, a, you know, the, the, the negative view on things is not going to help. So... I've, I've always had the view that you focus on what you can do and what you can improve rather than um, allow things to be you. Mm-hmm. And, and practically, Gary, do, do you need to prepare differently? And let's talk about running, which is, is this podcast's you know, focus. What, how, does, how do you approach? I mean, you mentioned you, know, you did a marathon yesterday. Do, does your prep uh, change massively compared to somebody who doesn't have Parkinson's in, in approaching a marathon? I don't think massively. I mean, things like I have to take my medication on time and so on, that, that's quite important. You know, you've also got to consider, I, I'd not for, for marathons in particular, but I did a an event in the summer called Arch to Arc where I ran from Marble Arch down to Dover and then we, with a group we rode the, the distance across the, the channel and then cycled to the Arc de Triomphe. And on the, the rowing bit, I was unfortunately seasick. And when you're seasick and you've got medication that you've thrown up, you know, that makes a big difference. And, it, and you don't know, know how much medication you've really taken on board, etc. So it's practical things like that that are a real challenge. I mean, for me, the, the challenges of Parkinson's and, and my medication are actually more about work and, and timing, you know, because when I get very tired, which doing a marathon will cause me to do inevitably. My medication works less effectively, so I, I'm more likely to, you know, have to to turn up and my tremor is, is, is not good. And that's, it doesn't seem to cause anyone else an issue, but it does cause me an issue. And so I, it's more about making sure you get more sleep when you need to, et cetera. I certainly, when I stepped down from the full-time role as CEO of EMEA, that was absolutely the right thing for me to do because I can now just manage my days a bit more effectively and, and make sure I get a bit more sleep and make sure I get the rest that I need. But it doesn't, it doesn't stop me doing the running, certainly. Can you tell us a little bit about your role at Parkinson's UK and, and how that came about and, and you know, what that entails? Because I know you mentioned raising awareness it is a, a, you know, really, really important. So tell us a little bit about what you do there. So I'm I'm the chair of Parkinson's UK, and it's it's a, a charity that that focuses on two things really. Firstly, helping people live with 
the condition and helping those people who live with it through someone else as well. So carers as well as people who, who have the condition itself. There's 145,000 people in the UK diagnosed with the condition. There's 18,000 new diagnoses every year and helping people deal with it is, is critical. Uh, the second element is searching for a cure or a way of slowing the, or, or stopping the condition itself. Uh, so we're, we're the largest charity in terms of Parkinson's research spend in uh, in Europe and there isn't enough spent but every, everyone would say this about every condition but there isn't enough spent to accelerate the the need for a cure and, and get get a cure rather than you know continuing to to have that 18,000 people be diagnosed and and have the same outlook as as certainly I had when I was diagnosed so the main thing for me is as the chair is how do we help the, the charity get awareness uh, and also how do we help people who have the condition get awareness of what they can do because it you know for a lot of people that diagnosis is very difficult for them to uh, take because most people don't really understand what the condition's about and uh, you know the first few months can be a real really troublesome time because people kind of almost assume that they're going to decline more rapidly than is often the case and it it sounds like the uh you know this search for a, for a cure uh it is well it, it, it's important but is there a is there a timeline is there any sort of sense of how close this is there are bits of progress and um i hesitate to be too positive because there has been progress before it's got to a certain level you know in terms of from the laboratory into clinical trials with with humans and then things either haven't worked or they've that they've not been large enough scale to be proven etc so i i think there are you know I, i'm not a, a scientist but it seems to me there are plenty of examples of of where there there could be progress and there could be success it's just it's very expensive to do clinical trials and and to test everything at the level that you really want to I want to talk a little bit about running and some of those amazing uh, runs that that you've been part of over the years. I mean, first question is, is, is there a run that sticks out in your mind as a special one? I mean, they all sound amazing, but is there something that you kind of recall and it brings back some some lovely memories of a particular running experience? Oh, gosh. Um, there's quite, there, are, there are a few. I mean... I, I did the Jungfrau Marathon in Switzerland, which is roughly 25 kilometres flat and then 17 kilometres up the side of the mountain. And about halfway up the mountain, you go around a corner and you see, you know, the, the side of the Eiger. And it's just such an incredible experience. And, I mean, I found with marathons, full stop, you know, you just get people collaborate, they talk, you meet people. Um, I mean, one of the benefits for me as an individual of doing marathons or, or doing running full stop is that you get to talk to people and, and, and in a different environment than you would do if you were, you, you know, sort of in a, in a business meeting. And um, it breaks down barriers. You know, when I go out running, when I've been out running in, 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 in marathons in uh, the Zurich sponsor where I used to be, um, you know, in terms of the Zurich business, I get to meet a lot of people within the business who I wouldn't have met in such an informal way. And it, it you know, I'm, I've sort of veered off your question to be honest, Dan, but um, I just think all bits of, of running are really helpful to me, actually, both in terms of understanding people, but also just the different experiences in different countries I've had. The camaraderie is amazing, isn't it? And, I, and this comes up so often in you know on the podcast of that there's a, a spirit, an energy around running, and whether that's you know a park run on a Saturday morning or or whether it is a you know the, a huge marathon, there is something about a, a community of people coming together. It doesn't matter how quick they are, or or you know, it's just people in the same space doing the same thing. It's so powerful, isn't it? It, it is. I, I um, just after I stepped down, we we went. Janice and I went on a sort of um, a long holiday, and we went to New Zealand. And I was running a marathon in New Zealand, and I got talking to this guy who was a chef from Argentina, 
And, you know, I would never have met a chef from Argentina in my, my sort of normal business life. And we had a great chat and I've kept in touch with him. I've kept in touch with a lot of people I've met through running. And uh, when you've got to go through 26.2 miles with someone, it, it's, you know, somehow there is a, a, a bond that comes as a result of it. It's, it's a great thing to do. And of all those marathons, is, is there a favourite? I know you said that, you know, they've all been amazing. Is there one favourite that you, you have out of all those? Ah, uh, gosh. Um, th- I mean, they're all for different reasons. I've, d- I've d- done different things, but San Sebastian, that was the second time that I've run San Sebastian and it, it is a lovely place to be. I mean, it's a beautiful venue. There's about 6,000 people who compete in the, the um, marathon and half marathon and 10K put together. So it's not that big a, a, an event, but there's just such a lot of support from the, the locality, the community there. And it, I, I don't, it's difficult to know how to describe it, but it's a great place in the world and a great place to go. And, and um, it's given me great memories. Tell me a little bit about this Guinness world record for the three-legged uh, 12 and 24 hour uh, races. How, how did that even come about? What, what was the thinking behind that? Well, um, I'd been, I'm, I'm a member of a local running club Tadley runners and we we've had a few trips abroad for, for for marathons over the years and we'd been to Kazichi for the the world peace marathon and I was talking about you know each year I try and do something a little bit more extensive than the year before and just doing another marathon another marathon was was you know going to be difficult to do I think so someone suggested why not come up with with breaking a, a world record and you look at all the world records and, and they're either exceptionally crazy or exceptionally difficult. So, you know, breaking the world record for the 100 metres just wasn't going to be the case. And a guy called Andy Tucker, who's a triathlete, um, said, why don't we try and break the three-legged world record? Mm-hmm. And we started investigating it. We were going to do a the world record in 2020 and we got people lined up to you know, come along and do a short distance themselves. A local community in Silchester was superb and allowed us to use their facilities. And then obviously COVID came and we had the problem that Andy and I, because we weren't in the same bubble, couldn't actually be, you know, strapped together on our legs to do the event. Yeah, we'd done so much preparation. We decided to have a first go at it with a mannequin tied to both of us in, in between us to keep us socially distanced. So we did 24 hours doing that. That obviously wasn't official as a world record. So we came back and did it in October 2021. And it was just, you know, it, it, it's difficult. It sounds a daft thing to do. And it was a bit of a daft thing to do. But the atmosphere, the support we had from people who ran alongside us, the support we had from the community and the support we had from people who sponsored and uh, the event were, were just was just superb, actually. What do you talk about when you when you with somebody for so long? Did, did you manage to keep the conversation going? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's weird actually that after a while you get used to a bit of silence. So we did a fair bit of training together. I mean, we we get on really well. We've done, you know, Andy was a big help in in uh, and his partner Teresa in in the Arch to Arc setup that we did. But after a while of, of running strapped to someone, you do get used to not having to to talk that much. We did, you know, we know each other very well. We've talked about lots of things. Unfortunately, um, Andy has some really bad jokes, which I know the punchlines to all of them. <laughs> but um, it, you just you just have to uh, accept that you can't. You're not going to speak for 24 hours. Gary, you're an inspiration, and I know you don't like being put up on a pedestal as 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 somebody that's inspirational, but you are. But in terms of leadership and business, who are the people that inspire you? Where do you look to to get your energy and inspiration from? Well, that's very kind of you, but um, where do I look? That's that's the important thing. I mean, I, I I look at all around me. I mean, when I was, I used to work for Fidelity, the investment house, and um, I learned a lot from Anthony Bolton, who wouldn't have described himself as a leader. He was a tremendous investor. But the way he dealt with not being as successful when, when he launched the China Special Situations Trust as he had been with his UK investments, 
Um, I mean, that, that sort of ability to learn, ability to recognize you haven't always got it right. That, that was something I learned from. I've tended to learn a lot from people in the teams that, you know, I've, I've worked with. So people like Tulsi Naidu, who, who was CEO of, of Zurich in the UK after me, but is now the um, uh, CEO of Asia Pacific for, for Zurich. I mean, she's, in, you know, such a bright person who had, has an ability to look at things in a very lateral way. Um, I mean, I could, I could go on. I think, I think it's really important that you're almost a bit of a sponge in terms of uh, the way that you learn and, and the way that you see how different people um, react to different situations rather than necessarily always looking for a role model in exactly the role that you're in, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to touch upon, you mentioned Zurich there. It sounds like they, they were amazing in, in supporting you and helping you you know on the you know on the journey and still are at, at this point what, what you know what why you know, why was that and and can you sort of speak to that importance of of companies embracing you know their people and, and the challenges that they might have because as you said at the beginning you almost uh, feel like I think you said and I, I'm paraphrasing but you said you, you didn't you're almost a bit embarrassed to bring it up and don't want to you know talk about it but what why and how how do companies how they react in a certain way how, why is that so important and and what was the difference at zurich i mean it it's it's difficult to understate how important it is or overstate how important it is rather but um i mean mario greco was was my boss in zurich and when i decided to stand down he was just superb why was he superb i think because underneath you know um all the 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 issues around you know managing a business etc i mean all businesses typically are around people and you know mario has a great heart actually and um and recognized the 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 situation i was in and and was just personally supportive as well as for the company i find it difficult to know why other than the you know the culture of an organization it's um you know it's about recognizing the value of your people and and I think it's 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 just back to this this age old comment, which is you you need to treat people the way that you'd like to be treated, and and I think most organisations that have that kind of philosophy and value their people and value what's different about them as well as you know I mean it it does go hand in hand with issues of inclusivity and diversity, and it it's just part of the culture, I think. And it's easier said than done, isn't it? I mean, it's part of the culture. Yeah, yeah. it is. Do, do you have any specific examples where running has given you a lesson or, or a takeaway, something that you've been able to transfer into your work or into your life? I'm not sure about a takeaway quite so much, but I, I do remember I was running in Frankfurt and um, I, I, the lesson that, that I learned is a very simple one, which is it becomes very easy when you when you speak English and and most business meetings everyone speaks English to you. You assume that you you don't need any different language skills and that everyone else will be able to communicate with you in the language that you're used to and you're comfortable with. And I went went out running in Frankfurt and and you know it's a very modern and cosmopolitan city and it's you, you know it, it's a very well known business city and I got lost. And person after person that I came up to didn't know, um, couldn't speak English. And I hadn't got my phone with me. And, you know, I, so I had no way of working out how to get back until eventually someone very kindly did know English and managed to sort my, my direction back. And I was about three quarters of an hour late for, for a dinner that I was due to go to. But the point being, you know, I just assumed that everyone would uh, could accommodate my lack of language skills uh -huh. and I'd done no pre-planning pre preparation and um and I learned a lesson very quickly actually so the lesson there is is to know how to ask wherever you are in the world know how to ask to get back to where you came from and where you started correct correct and uh, well, an old boss of mine used to call it curse of assumption you know you just assume something and it and then it uh, comes back to bite you very quickly yeah I think the other thing that um, uh, I've, I've learned is if you're going out running with a team of people from, from work, is it's very easy for it to, to stay as a business kind of mindset where everyone's trying to 
run at the same speed or the speed that the the most senior person runs at and um actually again it comes back to if you if you are sort of relaxed and you're prepared to you know to tell people that you're actually tired and you're you're you, you know you're, you're running to, it's running too fast and whatever then everyone relaxes and everyone just gets on with the run rather than trying to have this sort of ridiculous thing where the most senior person everyone's trying to um to to support them and make sure that they they look good and that uh they, they see it as a as a, a sort of a development session, which it isn't. It's just about relaxing and enjoying yourself. Because authenticity is is, is an overused word these days in in terms of business and and leadership, but it is so important, isn't it, that leaders these days um, are are genuine, are are authentic, and and it sounds like that was something a realization for you around uh just being who you are and being honest about who you are and and how you're feeling and and actually it's not a weakness is it it's it definitely isn't it makes you stronger it it does make you stronger and um you know i i mean i i hate having this condition and i, and I wish i didn't have it but it, one of the good things it's done to, to me is it has you know made me realize that there are things that previously I'd have been I'd have shied away from that I should just accept and, and, and get on with things and you know being vulnerable is one of those and it allows people the fact that you're vulnerable allows people to be more open with you and that means you get to see a different side of people and maybe a more open side which means it's easier for you then to to help them succeed and help knock down the right barriers for them. Thinking of the uh, Parkinson's UK role that you have, Gary, what what are the objectives across the next year? What what kind of things are you looking to achieve? We're looking firstly to make sure that people really do understand the benefit and the opportunity that comes with exercise. So we've got a lot of arrangements set up with people like Everyone Active so that you know people can get use of, of their local gym, their local sports centre for specific active activity courses, exercise courses, etc. We're also looking to to try and increase the support around Parkinson's nurses. So Parkinson's nurses are brilliant. The first person who, who I spoke to who really knew what they were talking about and could relate to me was a was a Parkinson's nurse. The number of people they have to support in managing the condition is about twice the level it should be so we're trying to to work with the nhs to to try and in, at difficult times for the nhs but to try and in, increase access to, to parkinson's nurses and then thirdly we think there's a real opportunity with technology to help people understand more about their condition and this i think does link very strongly into exercise so i can i i can use my smartwatch to know so much about what I do, you know, the the speed that I'm going, the recovery time, the stride pattern, all of those kind of things. And and we think there's more that can be done. We already know there's more that can be done in terms of using smartwatches to understand how people with Parkinson's recover and what's the best kind of combination of, of exercise for them. And then fourthly, we've got a whole range of different clinical trials that we're currently supporting and we want to make sure that we continue to do that and 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 hopefully one of them moves forward to to ultimately provide providing a cure or, or a um uh, something that stops the condition if i could pick up on that uh, data point you mentioned the information i think it's quite an interesting space as technology becomes more a bigger part of of health fitness and and and, and running specifically were you always a data person and, and and how how do you use the data that you get these days from your smartwatch so i was always a data person i was i mean i started my career was in direct marketing and um i loved the combination i, I still do of of marketing and creativity and data driven and you know and ob- objectivity so that, that's always fascinated me i probably spend too much time focused on the data from my smartwatch because sometimes it's not a bad idea to just go and run rather than to to worry about you know whether you you were faster on this segment or that segment but i think the data so for example we know that that exercise is good for you for parkinson's we know that generally more intensive exercise is better but but do we know enough about 
you know, for you as each individual, how that links with nutrition, you know, is, is there a limit to how intensive that exercise should be? And I think a, a more personalized experience of, of exercise and nutrition and diet and mindfulness, I think is, is within the grasp if we, if we pay the right kind of attention to it, actually. Do you run with music or are you somebody who likes to have silence and natural sounds around you when you're running? I, I like having natural sound actually. Um, if I go running with Tadley Runners, then I I just talk to people. I well, I don't, actually, it's not quite true to say I talk. I listen because talking and running and you know is not easy for me. I, I, not because of Parkinson's, just because I think it, you know it, it's always a, always a bit difficult to actually concentrate on talking. But actually listening, I, I quite like. And if I run on my own. I just, I'm fortunate to live out in the countryside and I just love, you know, that opportunity. So music doesn't do it for me, but it does it for a lot of people. So Running aside, Gary, uh, can you name a business tool, an app, maybe even a person, something that you, you couldn't do without? Oh, gosh, that's a difficult question. And, um, it, well, in terms of social media, we, we have at Zurich, uh, we have a, a thing called Workplace. And it's it's an equivalent to Facebook, and uh, but in in internally within the organisation, and I think it's a really good way of uh, seeing how the mood music, what people you know really think about things. So I, I wouldn't say I couldn't do. I don't think there's anything that I couldn't do without actually. And one of the things that you learn when you you sort of move from you know being on a group executive to to then stepping down and, and, you know, having a much more sort of life of more variety. I mean, I'm chair of England Athletics, I'm chair of Parkinson's UK, and I'm chair of the ZZ Foundation. They're all very different. And I've had to adjust to those differences. And it teaches you that, you you know, that it's, it's not apps that I can't do without, it's people that I can't do without. Mm, good answer. Do, do, do you miss that, that other life and the, the 